In the headlines, Korea's number two flag carrier Asiana Airlines gets a 45-day suspension by the Korean government and its services to San Francisco for last year's passenger jet crash in the city. Asiana says it's appealing. President Pakune arrives in Brisbane, Australia on Friday for a weekend summit of the G20 nations. The agenda includes anti-corruption, development and trade. And the Rosetta probe is said to be stable and is sending images back to Earth. But scientists fear the batteries could go out soon. Happy Friday, everyone. Welcome to Adira News. Coming to you live from Seoul, I am Kang Tae-ri. We begin with the suspension for the country's second largest flag carrier, Asiana Airlines. The company was told by the government to halt flights between Incheon and San Francisco for a month and a half following a fatal crash in the U.S. last year. Our Shin Zemin has the details. The Korean government has penalized Asiana Airlines with a 45-day suspension of its daily flights to San Francisco. This is for breaking the safety rules when one of its jets crash-landed at San Francisco International Airport in July of last year. The government says the decision was based on the civil aeronautics law as well as the loss of life and property that resulted because of the accident. The standard penalty of 90 days, however, was cut in half for the company as it is currently suffering management issues. The transport ministry also took into consideration the crew members' level of professionalism and efforts to help passengers after the crash. Still, the airline stands to lose over 13.5 million U.S. dollars during the suspension period. Asiana Airlines says it's appealing the decision, highlighting a potential inconvenience for its passengers given the high traffic on the route. The company also said that incidents like this usually result in a fine, not a flight ban. The decision is separate from the earlier penalty of $500,000 issued to the airline by U.S. federal transportation officials. Earlier this year, the National Transportation Safety Board concluded that pilot error and an over-reliance on automated systems were to blame for the crash, which left three passengers dead and more than 180 injured. Shin Zemin, Arirang News. President Park Geun-hye carries on with her three-country tour to attend various multilateral gatherings this week, and her final stop is in Australia. Our presidential office correspondent Chu Sun gives us a rundown of the president's itinerary at the G20 summit. President Buck has touched down in the Australian city of Brisbane, where she will join leaders of the group of 20 nations to seek an action plan to achieve a collective economic growth of 2 percent above trend in five years. The G20 predicts it will help the global GDP jump by some 2 trillion U.S. dollars and create millions of new jobs. As each member nation presents its own growth strategy, President Buck will introduce Seoul's efforts to spur domestic growth and expand the job market through social reforms, deregulation and supporting creative industries, also called a three-year economic innovation plan. On the sidelines of the summit, the Korean president will meet the Saudi crown prince to seek out more opportunities for Korean firms to invest in the Arab country's nuclear reactor and infrastructure construction. Seoul will also likely ask Saudi Arabia to take part in Korea's project to establish itself as the oil hub of Northeast Asia. President Buck is expected to hold talks with New Zealand Prime Minister John Key as well, where their two-way FTA negotiations will top the agenda. Having promoted her administration's economic and security policies to world leaders and highlighted Korea's contributions to global stability and prosperity, President Buck will wrap up her three-nation tour and return home on Monday. Choi Yusun, Arirang News, Brisbane. North Korea says it will send soon Choi ryong hye currently seen as North Korea's second in command, to Russia. Insiders believe the purpose of this trip is a meeting with Russian President Vladimir Putin next week. Our Kwon Soa explains what could be behind this visit. North Korean senior Communist Party official Choi ryong hye is headed to Russia as a special envoy for leader Kim Jong-un. 
Pyongyang state media reported this on Friday without specifying who he will meet or the timing of the trip. All that's known for now is that it will happen soon. Chue was one of the members of a high-level delegation that made a surprise visit to South Korea last month. Given his status, insiders speculate he'll most likely meet with Russian President Vladimir Putin to discuss the country's bilateral ties amid signs of their growing cooperative relations. The two are also expected to lay the groundwork for a future summit. Speculation about North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's possible meeting with Russia could put pressure on Chinese President Xi Jinping due to declining North Korea-China relations. A North Korea-China summit never took place during Kim Jong-un's three-year ruling. Pyongyang is also looking for Russia to play a role in barring the UN Security Council's push towards holding Kim Jong-un accountable for human rights violations. And on Russia's end, analysts say its efforts to boost bilateral ties with the North could be due to Moscow's growing isolation from the international community amid the ongoing crisis in Ukraine. As President Putin is scheduled to attend the G20 meeting in Brisbane over the weekend, chances are high that Chue's trip will take place the following week. Kwon Soa, Arirang News. UN human rights investigator Marzuki Deruzman has called for a concerted international pressure to bring about fundamental change in North Korea's human rights situation. Deruzman also says that cooperation with the regime would certainly facilitate that process. Our Hwang Songi tells us more. UN Special Rapporteur on North Korean Human Rights Marzuki Daruzman says North Korea's release of three American detainees was one dramatic response to concerted international pressure on the regime and added more pressure will bring fundamental change in the North's rights situation. Pressure works and therefore uh, there must be no let up on this uh, because uh, there will be no changes without uh, the international community uh, concertedly ex exerting political pressure on uh, North Korea. North Korea and its allies, including Cuba, want to water down a draft UN resolution on the issue, especially the part that refers the North Korean leadership to the International Criminal Court. With the General Assembly due to vote on the resolution next month, the Rusman advised against any revision. Uh, any removal of the accountability clauses would affect a, a setback in efforts to pursue accountability. Torture, starvation and enslavement are just a few of the widespread human rights violations against the 25 million North Koreans outlined in the Commission of Inquiry report. Daruzman proposed a two-track approach that involves a vigorous pursuit for accountability and working with the Hermit Kingdom. A, a second track to the accountability track would have to be uh, co cooperation with the regime in order to be able to uh, initiate uh, the beginnings of a long process to uh, improve the livelihood, the daily lives of uh, uh, North Koreans. Uh, Do you believe that North Korea will cooperate if the case is taken to the International Criminal Court? If there is no uh, cooperation, then the international community will have to uh, figure out how the accountability process uh, will be enforced uh, in spite of, uh, of non-cooperation on the part of the North Koreans. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. In exactly 10 days from now, the Korean military will hold defense drills on and around Korea's Tokdo Island in the East Sea. This is an exercise that's been conducted twice a year every year since 1986 to counter Japan's ongoing territorial claims to the island. Kim Yeonbin has more. The South Korean military is scheduled to conduct a defense drill aimed at deterring trespassers on its easternmost island of Tokdo later this month. A government source said Friday that the drill is scheduled to take place on November 24th, and the goal will be to repel non-military forces that approach the island via sea or air. 
The Korean Navy will employ five to six destroyers and convoys, as well as some patrol planes and fighter jets. The official says the Marine Corps will simultaneously conduct a landing exercise on Tokdo using a UH-60 helicopter. The exercise has been carried out twice a year since 1986, and the latest drill took place in May. Experts say the exercise is carried out to prevent Japanese forces from landing on the island. Japan claims that Tokdo is part of its territory, though it never established its sovereignty over the island. Seoul reclaimed sovereignty over its territory, including Tokdo and other islands around Korea, upon its independence from Japan's colonial rule from 1910 to 1945. Kim Hyun-bin, Samsung SDS, the IT services unit of Korea's largest conglomerate, Samsung, made its debut on the Korean stock market this Friday. It had a very strong start, with share prices more than doubling the initial public offering price. It closed after slipping a bit, though, to just under 300 U.S. dollars. Kim Jian has this report. Shares of Samsung SCS, the group's IT services affiliate, closed its first day of trading at 327,500 Korean won, or roughly 300 U.S. dollars on Friday. That's almost 14 percent lower than its opening price, making it the sixth most valued company in Korea in terms of market capitalization. Its opening share price doubled that of its initial price offering at the start of the trading, and this hype surrounding the company's IPO reflects high expectations the Samsung affiliate will be increasingly utilized as the group undergoes structural changes since its chairman Egon Lee was hospitalized in May following a serious heart attack. The three heirs of the Egon Lee family fortune own a combined 19 percent stake in Samsung SCS and Jimin, an analyst for Seoul-based Kium Security, says the heirs are expected to sell off their shares in Samsung SCS to pay their inheritance taxes. The analyst as the future of the company looks bright, mainly due to its distribution business, and expects the share price to rise well past $400, even after the hype dies down. Samsung Group's other affiliate, Tail Industries, is also going public later this year, raising the country's IPO volume to a three-year high to more than $2.7 billion. Kim Jong, Arirang News. Major Korean companies like Samsung Electronics and Hyundai Motor reported some disappointing third quarter earnings, and the outlook for the fourth quarter remains bleak as well. According to data compiled by market researcher FN Guide, the combined operating profit of 168 listed Korean companies in the fourth quarter is estimated at around 25 billion U.S. dollars as of Thursday. That's down some 11 percent from an estimate three months ago. The dimmer outlook comes as local companies are going through tough times with the weak Japanese yen, the slowing Chinese and Eurozone economies and sluggish domestic demand. But on the flip side, there are many industries benefiting from the popularity of the Korean wave, and one such sector is Korea's cosmetics market. Statistics Korea says sales have grown to more than 3.6 billion U.S. dollars in the third quarter of this year, an increase of more than 10 percent on year. Experts say the sales surge can largely be attributed to Chinese buyers, with the popularity of Korean dramas leading to growth greater interest in Korean makeup products. The Korean cosmetics market is expected to reach $14.6 billion this year. To tackle the problem of fine dust particles in the Northeast Asian region, Korea, China and Japan have decided to team up and to combat the problem together. The heads of the three countries' environmental research institutes uh, are meeting in Japan where they agreed on the need to come up with a new means to control yellow dust and air pollution. To continue this uh, trilateral cooperation, the representatives will meet again next year in Korea's southern city of Yosu. 
A new ranking for national brands is out, and Germany has overtaken the U.S. to have the best national brand. That's according to German market research firm GFK. Germany's high scores were driven by its victory at the 2014 World Cup in Brazil. And after having claimed the top spot in two, since 2009, that is, the U.S. now sits in second place, followed by Britain and France. The index measures the brand image of 50 countries in six categories, including exports, governance, uh, culture, people, tourism, and Im immigration and investment. More than 20,000 people in 20 countries were polled for this year's survey, and Korea was placed at 27th on the list. Now let's check in on the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission. After touching down on a speeding comet successfully, the probe is set to be stable and is sending images back to Earth. But scientists are fearing the batteries could go out soon. Ji Myung-gil tells us more. The Philae space probe that made history by touching down on a comet half a billion kilometers from Earth has achieved another remarkable first by sending back stunning images of the comet's surface. One of the photos released by the European Space Agency shows one of the lander's legs on the jagged, rocky surface of the comet. The agency thinks the lander could be resting on its side, possibly with one leg extended into open space and concerns arising about the probe's battery life. Philae appears to be sitting under the shadow of a huge crater wall, so scientists may have a hard time recharging its solar batteries. Scientists had been hoping for six to seven hours of sunlight to charge the batteries, but it looks like Philae will only get a maximum of two hours of illumination during every 12-hour rotation of the comet. Under the current circumstances, Philae may cease to operate beyond Saturday. Engineers are thinking of repositioning the probe to maximize the lander's exposure to sunlight. Regardless of what happens in the coming days, the mission's priority will be on collecting as much information as possible from the comet. Researchers hope to pull up some subsurface material for laboratory analysis. Scientists believe comets delivered water to planets and may hold some answers to the origins of life and the formation of the solar system. Philae has a Twitter account with all the latest images from the comet's surface. Users can check them out by following at Philae 2014. Kim young -gil, Arirang News. The world governing body of football is at the center of attention again over allegations of corruption surrounding the winning bids for the 2018 and 2022 World Cup. And to tell us more about this story and more, uh, Paul Lee is joining us from the News Center. Paul, FIFA's own ethics committee launched an investigation into these claims, but there are now seem to be conflicting views on the final report. That's right. Following the probe, which took over a year to complete, the FIFA ethics report cleared Russia and Qatar of alleged corruption in the bidding process. But the man behind the independent investigation has slammed the report as incomplete and false, reigniting a storm of controversy over the sport's most lucrative event. Our Connie Lee has more. These latest developments are a farce, even by FIFA standards. The head of an independent investigation into alleged World Cup corruption says FIFA's summary of his report is flat out wrong. The report, published Thursday morning, cleared Russia and Qatar of any significant wrongdoings in their winning bids for the 2018 and 2022 World Cups. Just hours after the report was published, Michael Garcia, the man who spent two years on the investigation, branded the report erroneous and said he would appeal to FIFA. The head of the English Football Association told reporters that he thinks the FIFA report is a joke. Then it has made a bit of, of a mockery of the whole process. If the person who did the investigation says the report didn't reflect what he believed, I'm, I, you know, I'm a bit shocked by it. All. I think it's now pretty ugly for FIFA. The FIFA report criticized England over its bid to host the 2018 World Cup, accusing it of disregarding the rules. The head of England's bid believes the entire ethics report could be questioned. 
process was flawed from the beginning in our view and it didn't have uh, the confidence that it should have done. Russia won the right to host the 2018 Games, beating England. However, suspicions have been peaked ever since Qatar, the 2022 World Cup host, was accused of paying bribes to FIFA officials in return for winning the hosting rights. Connie Lee, Arirang News. And turning to the crisis in Ukraine now, uh, Moscow and Kiev are clashing once again on the world stage, with each accusing the other of violating a September ceasefire. A lot of rhetoric, Paul, has been exchanged. What are the two sides saying? Well, the Ukrainian government says Russia is helping to resupply separatist forces in the east of the country for a possible offensive, while Moscow says Kiev is the one to blame for sparking tensions with the rebels. NATO has supported Ukraine's claims that Russia is sending military equipment and troops into the country's rebel-held east. The Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe also reported columns of unmarked tanks and troops coming from the Russian border. Speaking at a news conference in Berlin, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., Samantha Power, said Russia had committed blatant violations. As we have been throughout this crisis, uh, we are united in our message uh, to Russia, stop fueling the fire uh, with new weapons and support for separatists, um, withdraw all military personnel and equipment from Ukraine, uh, repudiate the illegal elections on November 2nd. Uh, the list goes on. Moscow has completely denied the allegation, dismissing them as mere propaganda. United Nations Security Council, meanwhile, convened an emergency session on Ukraine on Thursday over concerns that full-scale fighting could break out again. Mm. And the shifting back to the G20 summit in Australia, we just talked about the South Korean president's agenda there. Now, German Chancellor Angela Merkel has said that the upcoming meeting of world leaders should act as the catalyst for economic recovery. Those are strong words coming from uh, the world's uh, fourth largest economy's leader. Absolutely. Chancellor Merkel is sending a strong message and setting the tone for the international gathering. She made the remarks during a joint news conference with New Zealand's Prime Minister John Key ahead of the main summit on Saturday. Merkel called on the world's leading nations to step up and strengthen cooperation in developing the global economy. I expect that we will, thanks to the Australian host who prepared this meeting very well, send a clear message as to the further development of the global economy and also a clear message that we want to boost growth. We from the German side will underline that at the same time we wish for sound fiscal policies. We think that that is one of the preconditions for a robust growth. The G20 Leaders Summit in Brisbane is slated to focus on boosting world growth, securing the global banking system, and closing tax loopholes for major corporations. The crisis in Ukraine, however, is expected to dominate sideline discussions. Mm. And uh, finally, Paul, there's a political firestorm erupting in Washington. Uh, U.S. President Barack Obama has vowed to push forward with immigration reforms uh, through executive action. After the midterm elections, the Republicans are now firmly in charge of Congress, and it looks like, but it looks like Obama is not really phasing in, you know, in his attempt to realize this reform drive. Well, the president defended this latest plan to use his executive powers to change American immigration laws in order to fix what he called a flawed system. He said Congress had more than enough time to form its own plan but failed to act. If passed, the reforms would extend protection to undocumented workers who are parents of U.S. citizens, which could affect some five million people. During a press conference on Thursday, Republican leaders strongly voiced their opposition. Re-elected Speaker of the House John Boehner warned his party would fight tooth and nail over the issue. You know, uh, the president's threatening uh, to take unilateral you know, action uh, on immigration. Uh, even though in the past he's made clear he didn't believe he had the constitutional uh, responsibility or authority to do that. This is exactly what the American people said on Election Day they didn't want. Congressman Boehner said though no final decision had been reached, all options were on the table. House Republicans are reportedly threatening to block any funding for federal agencies to give out new visas or green cards, raising fears of another government shutdown. Charity? All right. Uh, thank you so much for those uh, stories, Paul. And we'll see you back here in just about two hours.
And that will do it for this edition of Arirang News. Uh, thanks for watching.